I'm, as, as, as Nico said, I'm Trisha and I'm a primary care physician and entrepreneur. Mainly that's the kind of two halves of my career. I think the thing that has kind of stayed constant through that is that I believe that medicine, healthcare, is based on relationships, relationships that are based on trust, and tr that trust is built on confidence. And if you believe that, and I imagine a lot of you would, it's fairly non-controversial, then um, intelligence alone, right, will kind of probably get you confidence. It's part of trust, it's probably instrumental, but it's not sufficient. And it certainly doesn't get your relationships outside of healthcare or within healthcare. So there has to be something else. Um, but let's think about where we are with respect to intelligence first. Lots of people have kind of brought it up in different ways. So back in 1995, when I was at medical school, um, I remember we went to kind of the equivalent of psychology 101. And it was basically said there's not really a good definition of intelligence. And I remember the professor saying this, you know, this kind of amusing tautology, intelligence is just what is measured by intelligence tests. Now, it's obviously not particularly satisfactory. It's kind of somewhat amusing play on words. But whatever it is, 30, and I can't believe it's that long, but 30 or so years later, we not, haven't really done much better. We don't have a kind of good definition of intelligence, be it biological or artificial, and therefore we don't have a particularly great definition of artificial intelligence either. So if we're to ask the question that um, lots of speakers have asked and lots of you will be thinking about, is today's AI, chat, GPT, BARD, whatever you're using, is that intelligent? Well, it can do some things really well. It can do standardized tests, it can do them in lots of different subjects, law and medicine and GRE and all these kind of things. It can do something like reasoning very clearly. It can do something like abstract thought, complex ideas, etc. But there's other things that it can't do. It doesn't do planning very well. It doesn't do numerical arithmetic problem solving very well. It has some really kind of amusing mistakes. And it doesn't learn from experience in the way that we do, right? You can train it on the entire internet in a kind of massive industrial process, and that you could call learning from experience. But it's not really in any kind of biological sense. So what I would say is that, yeah, it is probably intelligent. I mean, it depends kind of how you define it. And I would say it's kind of quote unquote intelligent. It's got some properties of intelligence and not others. And if those others are very important to you, then you would say it's not intelligent. And, but I would say it's kind of intelligent, but not in a human way but it's potentially scalable and very useful. And that is a significant advance, as we just kind of heard in the last talk as well. But intelligence is not enough. Like, um, and I think you know, if we believe that healthcare is based on relationships, relationships are based on trust, trust is based on confidence, it's part of the causal pathway, but it's not sufficient. I mean, all clinicians kind of find this element of, of being a clinician rewarding. Patients value it massively. It's why all professions in some way all of the clinical professions in some way um, include this as part of the training. But what is empathy, right? So empathy has a cognitive component. It's basically the machinery processing what is someone else going through and correctly identifying that. And then what's called an affective component, basically taking that information and feeling it yourself and wanting to do something potentially helpful to that other person or creature and doing so in a way that's, that's socially congruent. So you know, if you kind of look at clinicians or people who practice empathy, let's put it that way, then they describe it not as a cognitive event. They describe it as like an embodied feeling. I think particularly if you speak to like psychotherapists, psychiatrists, people in the so-called kind of talking professions, they have a kind of embodied feeling. They kind of feel it in their bones based on verbal and nonverbal cues, empathy. They describe empathy as visceral. If you bleed, I bleed. So the question that I really think we should ask and it's a controversial one, like, can AI be empathetic? Can AI demonstrate empathy? And I actually believe, although it's an easy question to ask, it's actually the wrong one. I think the question to ask is, can AI mimic empathy in a way that is useful? Just like we've learned to mimic intelligence, it's not quite like human intelligence, but it's intelligence of a form in a way that's useful to us. And that is a much more tractable question to answer. If we did that, then what we would have is, I believe, something called artificial empathy, or AE. So, if we have AE, I guess one of the questions is, do we have it now? Do the, do the models that we have at the moment, do they do that well enough? So this is a study from JAMA uh, last month, very recent. There's a lot of kind of words going on, but the most important bit is the bit underlined in red, which is you took a well-known social media forum. There were posts. Those posts were answered by uh, clinicians and by uh, ChatGPT. And then another set of patients were asked to um, evaluate those uh, responses on a scale of like quality and empathy. And the punchline is the chatbot responses were preferred over physician responses and rated significantly higher for both quality and empathy. Now, it's obviously absurd to think that the chatbot would have any sense of what 
these people that it had no knowledge of would feel is empathetic behavior, nor would it have any sense of what these people in the future who'd be reading those responses would consider as empathetic behavior, right? No one's thinking that, but just the kind of out of the box model shows something like empathy. So the question is, if we were to apply this, this straight up in the clinical context, would it work? Would it work if the other person knew that the entity on the other side is just mimicking? It's not kind of empathy in the human sense, but it kind of feels a bit like it. But does that actually work? Now this, if you're born before, uh, I guess after 1990, is it going to make huge amount of sense to you? If you I, I, clearly some people were, and I'm going to leave it in as a spicy Easter egg. Maybe you can just figure it out yourself. I mean, jokes aside, it's not, um, this is not just an abstract question, right? And the reason for this, so this is from the Institute of Health Metrics. It's years living with disability for working age people, the impact of disease on uh, their lives for working age people. So th this, is a, this is a map of morbidity. Some people in public health call it very dramatically, it's an atlas of human suffering. And um, each one of the conditions, the, their importance is represented uh, by their area within this rectangle. Now, if you look, obviously, at depression and anxiety, so these are the, the diseases that, for which talking therapies are most validated, a kind of cornerstone of care. Um, that's about 20% of all human suffering, which is a lot. But I think that's actually being too conservative. I think you actually have to include those diseases where there is also a psychological overlay. Like, you know, they may be a primary physical condition, and we could debate that. That's an interesting medical. But they have a, a, a significant psychological overlay. And uh, the talking therapies have been validated in these areas, but we can't get them to scale. I mean, single-digit percentages of people who need these treatments, as we've been brought up unsurprisingly in some of the talks before, given the scale of the problem, actually get access to them. So let's like, take away the color just to make this point. So if this is a map of human suffering, which I think we all agree that it is, two thirds of that suffering is in areas that need therapies that are principally empathy based, that we don't have any other solution at the moment to scale those. So I hope I've convinced you that AE is something important. Now, the question, of course, is like, how do we get there, right? And I think one of the most interesting things and understated things about the machine learning paradigm is that we don't necessarily need to understand the world through kind of like monastic study to be able to produce something useful. And we can look at the world as it is. We can observe it, and we can actually enshrine some of the things going on in the world in the biases and weights and other mechanisms of the machine learning model. Now, of course, if we just look at the... Um, consumer internet, which is like effectively the digital exhaust of like humankind, um, what you get is a lot of kind of noxious exhaust fumes and you also get some positive stuff as well. But if we take those models that have like a deep understanding of statistical associations within language and we fine tune them or we retrain them on the best of us, on care that we believe is empathetic, uh, that we believe is positive, that, that represents the diversity of human experience. And if we also do that, with people who also represent the diversity of human experience, then I think we can actually create something great. There's, a, there's no technical reason why not. Well, we don't have to end up in the Terminator scenario. I would argue it's a choice. And if we were to do that, I think the prize is really considerable. And I think this AE, it's kind of empathy. It's not empathy as we know it as humans. Uh, but if we get it right, it's something that's useful and scalable. And that's a really important invention. But some of you, I'm sure, are going to be um, feeling some sense of resistance to this. I think it's a totally reasonable argument to say, well, we want to use AI to automate all the other stuff. So like, as humans, we can just work with each other. And that's a totally fair argument. Some of you, if you kind of look to question this, and I think you know, I teach a lot of courses um, on AI for executives and business leaders. And one thing that I, I state is that this is emotional. And it's, it's fine for, for it to be that way. It's like this is a profound, challenging thing for us as human beings. And lots of you will be asking, like, well, given all this stuff, like, what will our role be as humans? So I think I'd like to answer that as well. So um, I, I would like to say that all of the scenarios that you've heard of today and otherwise are all going to play out at the same time. And that makes this in, inherently impossible to predict. Which one will predominate? No one knows. No one who's spoken today, no one that you're going to speak to really knows. This is a computationally irreducible problem if you want to kind of... Uh, put it in computer science language, but one of the scenarios is clearly that this tool, just like other tools, is going to make some of our lives easier. And one of the ways there, because these are kind of cognitive tools, that there'll be less cognitive load. So I would argue that given the less cognitive load and these new tools for empathy and intelligence, we might be able to use those to, as Socrates said, what, thousands of years ago, know thyself, to know ourselves, use that to actually know each other. 
be less adversarial. Maybe we would have much better tools for context to understand where other people are coming from. And then I would argue with that kind of strong base, maybe we could develop the courage and the resilience to actually go out in the world and create even more change. And one of those changes, of course, is with this technology or with anyone, that we try and aspire to get not just the highest absolute level of gains, but their fair distribution as well. So I guess my challenge to you is that if we're just thinking about these technologies with respect to uh, intelligence, I fear we're missing the boat. I think I challenge you all to also think about AE and when you're kind of experiencing these technologies and thinking where they're going to go, to deeply reflect on what is our role as humans in this brave new world. Thank you. Thank you.